Welcome to the Arthur Ross Gallery. I'm Lynn Marsden Atlas, Executive Director, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this really exceptional show, An Inner World, 17th Century Dutch Genre Painting. We are thrilled today to welcome you not only to the exhibition, but also to a very special event, a Baroque music concert by Filament Baroque Ensemble here at the Arthur Ross Gallery. Please come visit the show, which is on view through July 25th, and visit us often on our website for upcoming virtual events. Thank you.
That was incredibly moving filament Baroque ensemble. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and let's, yeah, let, let's bring you into a little conversation. And, and first, since you're all together on your screen, um, I'd like to say your names and if you could give a little wave um, just so we know who we're speaking with. Um, Evan Few, uh, who plays violin, and Elena Smith, uh, playing viola de gamba, and John Walthausen, playing harpsichord. Um, so thank you for that tremendous experience. I know that you'd rather all be together um, because you're performers, but I have to say I got lost met in many moments of that performance, and I, I'm sure that um, our uh, attendees feel the same. And I, I, I believe the chat is open, and I think uh, everyone is welcome to to um, to write your greetings and congratulations to the musicians. So. Um, Thank you so much, uh, Filament Baroque Ensemble. And it was a thrill to see you within the exhibition and inner, and inner world. And you captured so well the character and the exquisite attention to detail that we find in the paintings in the exhibition. So um, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Heather. Um, so I just really like to, um, I do see a question in the chat, which we'll get to, um, but just to start us out, can you talk about developing the program for the concert this evening? Sure. Um, you know, this was such a fun challenge putting this program together um, because we don't normally think of Amsterdam or Maiden or the Netherlands in general as a big pole for music making in the 17th century. We, always look towards Venice and Rome and Paris and Hamburg um, and some other different European cities. So it wasn't totally obvious to us at the beginning how we would put this together, but it was a great opportunity for exploration. Um, we kind of looked first at some of the real keystone Dutch composers that we know, like Svelink, who really wrote almost exclusively for the keyboard and for voices, and also Martin Peterson. Um, as another figure, and we kind of went from there. Mm. And it was in kind of in talking to a couple colleagues that the name Matthew Locke came up as an English exile who had spent some time in the Netherlands because um, he was a Catholic and couldn't, you know, couldn't be free to practice his religion in England. And we sort of started finding more and more evidence of kind of transit between England and the Netherlands. And we kind of wanted to play with this idea more. And, you know, so we also looked at other consort music, which we felt was also very kind of close in spirit to the music from the Netherlands. And we also looked at some Dutch people who were spending time in England, like the Suzanne van Solt family which was a Dutch merchant family that was living in London. And this was keyboard music written for the daughter of the family, Suzanne. So um, could you just talk a little bit more about the Suzanne Bensolt um, manuscript for those of us uh, who don't know? Yeah, um, it's a really precious document from the time and a pretty kind of singular document. Um, it's a book of music for the keyboard um, that was compiled probably by a teacher of Suzanne, who was a girl presumably learning how to play the harpsichord or the virginal or the organ um, in London. And I think what's so cool about the manuscript is that a little bit like keyboard books for kids today, it was all kind of a compendium of music that she would have known. Mm -hmm. And so that included, you know, these kind of rustic dances, which for me kind of remind me of like country dances and other dances that are even pretty familiar to us today. And um, psalm tunes, which were the hymn books of Dutch Calvinists. And, um, you know, for this performance, we sort of adapted some of selections from that manuscript for our ensemble the two dances for um, violin, gamba, and keyboard. And then the psalm tune in the middle, I kind of riffed on a little bit <laughs> in the spirit of some other kind of keyboard riffs of that period. Yeah. It is it is worth noting that that was John's improvisation yeah, for that absolutely. song. So, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so 
you developed this program. Um, could you've spent some time in the exhibition now? Uh, you know, many hours with your with your concert, but also um, you spent time with the catalog and in the gallery. Can you talk about how this program, these pieces, this music relates to some of the themes within the exhibition and this central concept of an inner world? Sure. Um, well, I think it's worth thinking about the fact that in, in the Netherlands, uh, in the 17th century specifically, um, public music wasn't really that much of a feature of, of everyday life in that country. And because Calvinism um, sort of didn't uh, look so favorably on, 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 on um, you know, extravagant gatherings or, or anything of that sort. So um, music was was primarily made in the home in domestic settings. And town musicians would gather in sort of ad hoc settings to give concerts, but um, the primary uh, avenue for music making was in the home. And so I, I was thinking about this today. And I mean, specifically for the shop, this, you know, publication of, of largely dance music, but also songs um, for smaller ensembles was really uh, ideal for, for that setting. I mean, the worlds that are depicted in those paintings would have been the worlds in which that music was made. And I think that, that would, that's a really interesting parallel that we, that we found over time, spending time in the, in the exhibition, so. And can you talk about the scores themselves? Um, John and I had a conversation at one point about the scores as, as physical objects and the practice of collecting music. And I'd love to hear a little bit about that in relation to this program. Yeah, um, I think one thing that's interesting about this program is that some of the music was collected in manuscripts like the Suzanne von Zolt manuscript and some of it was published, like mm -hmm. the violin sonata of Martin Peterson and also the collection of Johann Schopp, mm -hmm. I believe. Yeah. And I think, you know, of course, this is two very different modes of dissemination for these scores. But one thing that we do know is that they were both really treasured um, by people who owned them. You know, um, published scores were incredibly expensive and you know, we're a real collector's piece um, in a way that I think is kind of hard to imagine today for people who grew up with, you know, G. Shermer, um, these very inexpensive things that you <laughs> plunk on your piano <laughs> and, you know, were made to be published by the millions. And I think manuscripts even more so because it meant that someone had copied it out by hand for you and, you know, oftentimes gathered in a, in a very luxurious leather binding that mm -hmm. you could really keep and you know you were the sole possessor sometimes of some of this music and we were kind of inspired by some of the rare books that you see in this really fabulous exhibit um an inner world and you know just how treasured these books were uh, we have a few questions that um, relate to each of your instruments, and so I'm going to put them together for you. Um, Lara is asking for, for each of you, and we'll ask you to, to go one by one. Um, maybe can you tell us a bit about your backgrounds and how you came to study and play Baroque music? Um, and so I think I might suggest that Elena start us out because we also have a question uh, about your instrument and, and how you hold the bow and maybe how it relates to um, customary um, playing. Uh, and then we also have a question maybe next about John's instrument as well. Sure. Um, well, the instrument I was playing, the viola de gamba, viola, viol, string instrument. Um, gamba is leg in Italian. So as, as you saw, um, the viola de gamba is held between the legs. There's no end pin like the modern day cello. Mm -hmm. um, the viola de gamba has, uh, the instrument I was playing had seven strings and frets. So it is actually a, a relative of the guitar family, um, more so than the violin. Um, the bow, if I don't know if anyone was looking close enough, but you could see um, I was hold, holding my bow underhand as to, uh, opposed to Evan, with the violin and uh, cellists hold the bow overhand. Um, so that's a difference. Um, 
Yeah. And it was um, our, my colleague, Sarah, who was asking, yeah. who is also a, a Vine Atlanta. So she had a keen eye for that. Um, oh, great. <laughs> please also tell us about how you got into um, playing Baroque music, Elena. Absolutely, yes. Well, um, uh, I'm also a modern cellist. I grew up playing, playing cello. Um, my, I was lucky enough to be born into a musical family and um, we, we always had early music going on in the house. My older sister is a Baroque oboist and recorder player. So I was exposed to a lot of different music. Father's a composer. Um, I was exposed to a lot of different music all throughout my um, uh, upbringing and all of that. Um, and then I started playing viola da gamba when I was in high school and really enjoyed that repertoire. It's so different from um, you know, the cello repertoire that I got my degree in and it, I, I really enjoyed playing with these two. And it, it's really a, a totally different kind of playing, a different kind of um, musical analysis and um, very, very different sound world. Yeah. Absolutely. And, uh, Mary is asking about your instrument, if you if you would, and your background. I'm I'm so so glad you asked because um, this is not normally the instrument that I take out for gigs with filament. Um, you know, on the program says I'm playing harpsichord, which is true, but this is kind of a special harpsichord um, known in different languages by a lot of different names. Um, the English would call it a virginal because it was a preferred instrument of Queen Elizabeth the <laughs> First, um, the Virgin Queen, and um, the Italians generally call it spinetta or spinet. And um, the Dutch will call it kind of depending on some technicalities, either a virgin, either a spinetta or a musilar. Um, and it's a kind of smaller harpsichord. These were kind of built as more inexpensive instruments to be owned in a middle class home. Um, you know, they were kind of appropriate learning instruments. And because of the way that the strings are positioned and because of the way that the um, plectra actually pluck the string, it has kind of a bell-like, or I even think sometimes kind of harp-like sound, um, which is really interesting. Um, you know, I, I don't, there were no music scenes in this particular exhibit, but I think Vermeer actually has a number of paintings of music lessons mm -hmm. of people playing the virginal. Um, a lot. So there's a lot of cool imagery if you if you look it up online. You can see this is just a really big part of people's everyday musical life. Yeah, thanks. I made a note to myself that the the sweet link uh, was just spectacular <laughs> on your instrument and that that contrapuntal complexity, uh, which is a term I looked up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, wow. We while we were workshopping this program, um, John had had mentioned the idea to use the virginal for maybe a few pieces, um, but it was actually not originally our um, our plan to to okay. use the virginal for the entire program. And we started rehearsing in uh, John's bedroom where the virginal <laughs> lives, and realized that um, the sound world that it created and that we were responding to was just like so satisfying. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and so it was a real pleasure uh, to to play with that instrument for this program. And I, had, I thought it looked really good in the red, uh, red, <laughs> red, red version. It was a lucky <laughs> coincidence. <laughs> I couldn't believe it when I saw it. It, it was so, <laughs> so perfect. You totally got the memo. And, and thank you for that, because that was a question that had come up, um, Gail asking, is that why? John picked a virginal for the concert, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, our, our visual savvy wasn't quite there. So it was a happy coincidence. Um, and Evan, if you would please talk about your instrument and, and your background. I know you're also a, a fellow Oberlin graduate. Uh, is that right? Um, I both graduated from Oberlin. And it was, I went to Oberlin um, as a modern violin student, uh, having had no experience in, 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 in uh, historical performance of Baroque music. I had played some, you know, Bach, but I didn't really know about this whole world of, of historical instruments and uh, styles of playing. And um, so it was really kind of a whim um, for me in my second year of study, I, I decided to take the beginning Baroque violin group class, um, which was taught by 
my violin teacher, Marilyn McDonald, who also teaches uh, modern violin at Oberlin, and um, just fell pretty naturally into the style. Um, I had, I mean, obviously learned quite a lot, but from, from that beginning moment, um, it was a sort of physicality to the to the way of playing on that strings, which respond really differently from standard steel strings. And with the different shape of the bow, um, it just kind of felt really nice to me. And so I, I uh, over the course of my study there, began um, to fall kind of in love with that. And not only the way of playing, but this, this wonderful, um, repertoire that exists outside of the standard um, that we learn in conservatory. And so that was just really fascinating to me. That was sort of my entry point for Baroque music. But. Thank you. I see a comment that I'm going to turn into a question. And this is from Larry Yeager Christel, who's the curator of the, the Leiden Collection, our partner, um, thanking you for the wonderful performance and saying that she loved seeing and hearing you play in the gallery together with the paintings, which I would take as a, as a high compliment. Um, so can you talk about the experience of playing and recording in the Arthur Ross Gallery surrounded by these important, you know, rare, wonderful um, 17th century Dutch paintings. Well, I mean, it was such a it was such a pleasure for us um, because, you know, not only did it set, in, set such a beautiful ambiance, but I think it also kind of brought us to a deeper kind of examination of the music in a lot of ways. Um, one thing that I know you were playing with or in the curation was this kind of juxtaposition between, um, you know, the very allegorical, very kind of intellectually themed paintings. Like I think of this really st stunning, um, huge portrait of an allegorical figure and some of the emblem books and how that's contrasted with these kind of more popular scenes. Mm -hmm. And I think we find this so evidently in the music. Um, I mean, um, the English the English music that we played um, is is so intricate and so um, in a way has a kind of introspective quality. I find, um, which is characteristic a little bit of English music from that time in general. But these Fantasia suites um, are really so f are are just like rife with details that are that are really delightful for the performer. Mm -hmm. um, and I and I hope that they come across in the performance, but really like the the true enjoyment is in just sort of uh, making that music in real time and hearing the way that the different lines kind of interact. And that degree of detail and how much we enjoy that really I, I, I you know found a lot of parallels between the emphasis that the exhibition makes on the eye for detail and the sort of enchantment with with all of these mi uh, minutiae uh, that the that the painters who are featured had, you know, and that was sort of their their um, mo, you know, and yeah. so we can re really relate to that. I guess. Yeah. I think the other thing that kind of struck me a little bit is, you know, you talked about how these paintings were made to be lived with, you know, how they were kind of purchased to live in people's homes. And of course, as a museum goer, you don't have that same experience. You know, you usually see it once and you move on. But we were there for a, a pretty so, long yeah, morning. So true. we were kind of always looking at them, going away, revisiting them, and always kind of <laughs> seeing them in different ways. And that was a kind of rare privilege. So if anyone is planning to go see the exhibit, I would say, you know, go see it once, maybe grab some coffee or have lunch and come back. Because, <laughs> because the works really lend themselves to that. Yeah, and I have to thank my colleague Suzanne for for managing your the production or the managing uh, and facilitating your your day at the gallery. And also, again, I have to remark at Alex's editing, which just brought it to life. And I honestly forgot that I was not not there with you. Amazingly, um, I was when we were watching the video. I was kind of thinking, I wish that Alex were with us because <laughs> because he is sort of I, John. John mentioned this earlier, but he. He has done a number of uh, productions for us at this point, and so he feels a little bit like an honorary 
uh, member of the ensemble. So. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Uh, we had another question entered into the Q&A, and this is about um, the William Law's Sweet and D major, um, about the Galliard, uh, you know, finale section that you played, um, saying, um, this is from Matthew, um, who's been reading about the Galliard uh, as quite an athletic dance in which um, a male had an opportunity to show off to his dance partner. <laughs> Um, <laughs> about the music maybe being more tempered. Um, could you give us your insight into the style of music as it relates to the dance? Ooh. Ooh. Interesting. I didn't know that about the gallery. Did you know? <laughs> I, I had I had known that, and I think it's funny because you know we have so much of these dance forms in the 17th and 18th centuries. And um, they're always, you know, sometimes we feel that they're very locked into the physicality of the dance. And sometimes it can be much more referential that it's conjuring, you know, just the meter or kind of the dance rhythms from an actual dance Gaillard. And, you know, and it can be very, very abstract and very kind of much playing with the form or very direct. And I think laws always tends towards much more abstract. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's true. I, I will say though that I think that Galliard and the one in the, the G minor suite both have a sort of jaunty, almost jagged character, mm -hmm. which I guess could be a reference to um, the actual dance. But I, I agree that I think. Yeah. The, the the dances are these are not meant to be danced to they are sort of abstract uh, forms so. and in a way it's kind of physically athletic for us as players i mean that <laughs> final is, laws had a lot of um a lot of it, it was quite quite a workout a of, <laughs> for us so. string crossings <laughs> you know, so um, yeah thank you um so again i think as part of that conversation um you answered a question about, you know, whether the music was intended to, to really be danced to or whether it was really more about listening. Um, another question that's come in, do all three of you still go between Baroque and other repertoire? I do quite a lot. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I do as well. Yeah. I have I have a double line as an organist too, and um, where I play in Germantown has an instrument from mostly from the 1910s, which is a very symphonic instrument that is so far from a Baroque conception of an organ. And um, yeah, Nelly in particular plays a, plays a lot of symphonic music as well as a modern cellist. Right, right. <laughs> Um, I am primarily a, a Baroque violinist. I, I do play a, ra a pretty wide range of repertoire, including even into the 19th and, and sometimes early 20th centuries I have done in historical contexts on, 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 on gut strings with, you know, if playing orchestral music from the 19th uh, century or 20th century with winds, wind instruments from the time, which uh, our colleagues can actually often find on eBay or have built by, <laughs> by, by wind uh, instrument makers. But um, for, for several years now, um, my, my performance have been in the historical performance uh, realm, so. Thank you, Evan. And John, I think if you would be willing to share, I, I think everyone would enjoy you being more specific about the organ that you play and, and where it is, if that's okay. Oh, sure. Um, <laughs> for anyone in the Philadelphia area, um, any Sunday morning, I'm usually on the job at First Presbyterian in Germantown, um, which is a very historically and architecturally significant space. Um, and yeah, the organ is such an interesting instrument. And I think this is true of all keyboard instruments that you know, it has developed with, every, with um, the times and has never really been standardized. Um, so the instrument that I play week to week, um, the keyboard is actually connected to the pipe work through an, uh, an electrical mechanism rather than a mechanical one. And the kinds of stops that I use um, are you know, really evoke the sound of a 20th century orchestra. So I have tons of string stops. Um, 
there's even one stop that is a saxophone, which <laughs> in, was a pretty new <laughs> instrument uh, when the organ was first built and I have a celesta stop and chime stop. So I have, you know, really all the trappings that the 20th century brought to us. And, you know, in the time of Sphalink, um, his instruments would have evoked um, instruments that were common in his time. So lots of Renaissance wind sounds like shawms and crumb horns and, and rankets and things like that, which are very unfamiliar to us, but would have been part of his musical vernacular. Wow, this this talk of all of your your instruments is so delicious. Like we have to have a follow up program sometime. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Um, before we sign off, um, how can how can folks see filament in the future? What do you have anything coming up that you'd like to promote here, either individually or as an ensemble? That's uh, yeah. We have we have uh, plans actually. Um, Speaking of First uh, Presbyterian Church in Germantown, um, that sanctuary will serve as a venue for um, our 2021-22 uh, season opener, um, which is uh, for October 1st. Um, it is our first uh, collaborative project, so we're, it's, we'll be the three of us plus a small uh, a team of, of colleagues, mostly from Philadelphia, also from Baltimore. Um, it's a program of the music of J.S. Bach. Mm -hmm. um, and it will feature, the, the sort of headline work is um, one of his uh, secular wedding cantatas uh, that Rebecca Myers, is, who is a soprano in Philadelphia, will be singing with us. Um, and if people want to learn more about that, they can go to our website. Mm -hmm. Which uh, is? which is filamentbaroque.com. Um, and information about that concert is uh, under the, the tab that says support. So um, you would have an opportunity to learn more about that and potentially um, help us out. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make it happen. And, and there's a, a question about th this concert's availability. That was my next point in, in signing off is that we will be posting this to um, the information event page on our website. I believe I can promise that by tomorrow afternoon. Uh, and it will be up through the rest of the e exhibition and, and possibly beyond. Um, but we're, we're thrilled to share that to an even um, greater audience and ask all of you to, to send the link to friends who are gonna enjoy the program. Um, and uh, this, so this is the penultimate event in our exhibition programming. The last event is July 7th at noon. Please join us for a 12 minute gallery talk with Lara Yeager Kersout, co-curator uh, of an inner world 17th century Dutch genre painting, um, who will be speaking about the exhibition and you can register on our website and the link is in our chat. Um, so on behalf of, of Everyone in the audience, I would like to thank you with my whole heart, uh, Filament Baroque Ensemble. Thank you for this fantastic performance. Um, we are so proud to present it. Uh, and to everyone in attendance, I wish you a wonderful evening and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so, so much, much, everyone. Thank you.